Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. July 20, 1969. Neil Armstrong steps out of Tranquility Base. America has surpassed communism in power, courage, and capability, and two men are on the moon. Who helped bring this about, and how? America had been experimenting with many projects long before the creation of NASA. These projects included rocket-powered fighter planes and the United States' own satellite, Explorer 1. However, they had been limited to strictly military projects until 1958, just over a decade before the fateful moon landing. The United States is in a panic as the Soviet Union puts their satellite, Sputnik, into orbit. Desperate to calm the public and compete with the socialist nation, Dwight D. Eisenhower signs the National Aeronautics and Space Act, establishing NASA. NASA got off to a great start with German scientist Werner von Braun on their team. Von Braun gave NASA the V-2 rocket and later designed the Saturn V that got Apollo 11 to the moon. However, he had a major flaw. Infamously, von Braun worked for the Nazi party during World War II, who had used the V-2 rocket to bomb America's allies. Von Braun, however, surrendered himself and his technology to the U.S. during the war, claiming he did not do so out of fear, but, quote, wanted to see the world spared in other conflicts such as Germany had just been through. Years passed. Both the U.S. and USSR moved ahead, fighting to win the race to space. Our Mercury project got Alan Shepard into space, but not before Russia did the same to Yuri Gargarin. Then John Glenn became the first American to orbit Earth, again beaten by Gagarin. It seemed America couldn't win against the socialist superpower until a speech by John F. Kennedy turned the world upside down. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. On September 12, 1962, Kennedy spoke these words, practically daring the USSR to beat them to the moon. The space race picked up the pace and the Cold War was up for grabs. America and Russia raced to design and build lunar craft. NASA began work on the Apollo program, and the Soviets began work on their own moonshot operations. NASA soon developed a plan to get men to the moon. Launch a craft with a lander module and a command module on the Saturn V rocket. After getting to a stable orbit, reignite the rocket to set a course to the moon. Then remove the casing on the lander module and dock it with the command module, separating the launch stages and constructing the craft used for the rest of the flight. If needed, make course corrections and wait out the three-day trip to the moon. Once at the moon, establish an orbit and remove the lander from the command module. Achieve a vertical descent with the lander and touch down on the moon. After landing, explore the moon's surface and collect samples, doing as much as possible to describe the moon to scientists. Separate the top of the landing stage from the bottom and blast off leaving behind an American flag as proof of the landing along with the landing gear, and redock with the command module in moon orbit. Transfer all samples from the moon to the command module, and discard the lander to crash on the moon. Set course back to Earth with the command module. Discard the engine and face the heat shield towards Earth, readying the craft for re-entry. After falling for a time, deploy parachutes and splash down in the ocean to be picked up by the Navy. The plan sounds complex, and that's because it is. However, it was the most plausible, and NASA adopted it. After 10 equipment tests, Apollo 11 was readied for a 1969 flight to achieve the goal set by Kennedy, going to the moon and living to tell the tale. Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong, all veterans of the Gemini Project, were selected for the mission. The launch went smoothly, and within three days, the men were over the moon. Collins stayed aboard the command module while Aldrin and Armstrong boarded the Eagle lander 
and sank down into the unknown, preparing for the worst as the moon got closer. Around the world, tension was brewing as the world's largest television audience ever strained their eyes to be the first to know the answer to the long-asked question, would man get to the moon? Nobody could predict the outcome of the flight. Even then-President Richard Nixon prepared two speeches, one for if the astronauts were successful, and another for if they were stranded on the moon. It all happened very fast. The Eagle had landed, Mission Control acknowledged Tranquility Base, and Americans around the country breathed a sigh of relief as the whole scene played out in their living rooms. Freedom took the lead that day, and the USSR fell behind. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. By this time, NASA was becoming quite popular. The American public fell in love with the new frontier of space, and the genre of science fiction re-emerged. Shows like Lost in Space and Star Trek cashed in on the space race in America. Even across the pond in England, sci-fi took hold with shows like Jerry Anderson's Thunderbirds, whose main characters are named after famous NASA astronauts. The USSR soon came up with a new idea. A space station, Salyut, which would orbit Earth as a base in space. They went through with their plan, and Salyut 1 became man's first space station. NASA naturally began designing their own space station, which would act as a lab in the sky. Aptly named Skylab, the plan was basic. Launch it on a Saturn V, get it into orbit, and send up a crew to work on it, and learn what nobody on Earth could. Projects included a study of the sun, as well as study of the Earth. On May 14, 1973, Skylab was put into orbit and was visited around a week later by Skylab 2. The astronauts aboard Skylab 2 successfully docked with the station and performed all kinds of experiments. These ranged from observing sunspots to watching water droplets float around the capsule. The mission was and is considered a great achievement for NASA. Two more missions were sent to Skylab before it was intentionally destroyed. By 1975, times had changed. The U.S. and the Soviet Union had come to a relative calm in the Cold War known as detente. Six more Apollo missions had flown since Armstrong made his one small step. Both the Soviets and the Americans had space stations above the Earth. A new kind of space flight was conceived by the two superpowers, a joint venture which would be the first of its kind, a cooperative mission, the Apollo-Soyuz project. The respective missions launched, with Apollo and Soyuz flying as planned. They soon docked, and in a historic moment for the world, the astronauts and cosmonauts met each other with a handshake between the capsules. The crews ate lunch together, performed experiments together, and even talked in the other nation's language. Cosmonaut Leonov later said that there were three languages spoken on the mission, Russian, English, and Oklahomsky. Ever since the moon landing, NASA had been thinking about making a reusable space plane capable of orbiting Earth, then returning and landing on a runway. This high-flying plane would be called the Space Shuttle, and would be America's craft of the future. The North American Rockwell Company, now known as Boeing, began working on the shuttle after it was announced in the January of 1972. The first of these white and orange giants, the Enterprise, was rolled out four years later, on September 17th. 1976. In 1977, the Enterprise went through some tests for the shuttle's design. All tests went perfectly according to plan, and America returned to space. Four shuttles capable of orbit were built as an upgrade from the Enterprise, and all the shuttles did missions that helped advance science and keep mankind in space. One such mission was the construction of the International Space Station. NASA and the USSR were both working on new space stations, the Freedom and the Mir-2. However, in 1993, the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War ended, causing the two plans to merge into the ISS. Also contributing to the project were Japan, Canada, and the European Space Agency. And on November 2, 2000, the first three men arrived at the station, two from Russia and one from America. 
They stayed for 136 days until the next mission arrived. The station continues with an uninterrupted human presence today. Of course, the ISS isn't the only thing the shuttles put into space. Many satellites were sent up into orbit with the black and white giants, including the famous Hubble Space Telescope. An observatory in space had been a concept since the 1920s, but had not been realized until April 24, 1990, when the shuttle Discovery launched the Hubble into orbit. However, it was soon apparent that there was a problem. The primary mirror was flawed, producing such horrible pictures as these. NASA had to repair the Hubble or else two and a half billion dollars would go to waste. The repair crew was prepared for action, learning how to use around a hundred specialized tools, and were sent on their mission December 2nd, 1993. They spent around ten days servicing the satellite. The operation was successful, and the telescope began sending back beautiful pictures of the universe like these. Take a moment to look at them. NASA had, by this time, sent two unmanned probes to Mars. They had done alright, but lacked the ability to explore. Thus, NASA had an idea. Send remote-controlled robots to the Red Planet and really begin to learn about our closest neighbor. Naming the first rover Sojourner, NASA launched it December 4, 1996, and landed it on Mars on Independence Day, 1997. It sent back images like these, as well as lots of scientific data previously unknown about Mars. Three more rovers have been sent to Mars since then, Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity, all of which landed successfully and have helped advance man's understanding of space. NASA is still active in space and planning for the future, but they're also slowing down. The Space Shuttle program was retired in 2011, ending with the Atlantis touching down on July 11th. NASA is now sending Americans to the ISS aboard Russian spacecraft. NASA is indeed changing gears, and the world is seeing the rise of big companies going to space. Big companies in space are a fairly new factor, and are only possible with modern technology. One company such as this is SpaceX, a California corporation that is currently sending supplies to the ISS. They're also working on more powerful rockets and even the human landing on Mars. Another company is the British-run Virgin Galactic, a division of Virgin Airlines more focused on tourism. This company will offer suborbital space flights to all takers for the right price. However, don't expect to fly in Spaceship 2 anytime soon, as this right price happens to be $200,000. NASA truly changed the world and the way we look at it. From Houston to Jupiter, from Cape Canaveral to the moon, no matter where they went, they went for the benefit of all.
problem Go to Rockets for Might respond Hello Major Tom Are you receiving? Turn the fences on We're standing by There's no reply Four, three Father, you for sure.